And I'm going to look at four different points today of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you do not believe that Jesus is Messiah, Jesus is Christ, Jesus is Savior, this message is for you. If you're a Christian, hopefully this will gear you up and arm you with the truth of the gospel so that you can go out and share the gospel with those that hate Jesus Christ and God. Every single person in here at one time in their life has rejected Christ has given up on Jesus and God and and thought, maybe some of you have even thought it was a fairy tale. I lived a godless life. I was an outlaw. I rejected Christ. I walked in my sin of sexual immorality and drunkenness and sorcery and pharmakia, lying, power, violence. There's very few uh, sins that I see in the Bible that I have not committed. Did God in his mercy and his grace reach down in his great love for Garrett Grobner and save me from Garrett Grobner and his sin? And I have dear friends that were once homosexual men that I was on the mission field with who now have families. I have dear friends whose children are wayward and lost God's arm is not too short that it cannot save. He saved this man from the gutter. He saves from the, to the uttermost, from the gutter most. Because that is my king. I love him because he first loved me. He loves me with an infinite love. And so when Peter, when the Holy Spirit falls upon the church... And all these supernatural signs and wonders begin to take place. The people begin to question and Peter puts it to rest. And he says, look, there is a, the wrath of God is coming. The end of the world is coming. And I believe it's sooner than we believe. Yet even in my last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit because I want to, I want people to be saved. And maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you've never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if that's you this morning, I want you to pay really close attention because this is the most important thing that you will ever hear. And it's in regard to the saving work of Jesus Christ and the person of Jesus Christ, the mind blowing mind-boggling gospel of love has far-reaching implications, eternal implications for you and for me and for the world. You see, the cross of Jesus Christ reveals God's love at best, at its best. And man's sin is its worst. It's the defining line between heaven and hell. Between dying unrighteous and dying righteous in Jesus Christ. This salvation is so simple we can overlook it, yet so great that we can never comprehend it. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. The great mercy and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. The redemption, the salvation from sin of Jesus Christ. The wisdom, the manifold wisdom and grace of God in Jesus Christ. The abundant life in Jesus Christ. The mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Our Savior, Jesus Christ. Saves us from our sin, saves us from ourselves. Saves us from our hopelessness, saves us from our despair, saves us from our lostness, and gives us freedom. That's who He is. And I want you to know Him this morning. If you don't know Him, I'm going to give you an opportunity to know Him. Jesus changes everything. Everybody say that with me. Jesus changes everything. Jesus is everything. Say that with me. Jesus is everything. Oh, the beautiful gospel. When God reached down into the pit of my lostness and despair and reached me and grabbed me and set my feet upon the rock, which is Christ Jesus, I'll never be the same. Now the Jews, yeah, thousands of them would get saved, but here's the thing. These Jews, these devout men, 
were waiting on their Messiah. The transforming gospel would be rejected by the Jews because they thought King David was the picture of what they thought the Messiah was going to be. So I'm going to give you four points of what the Messiah truly is and how they missed it. They thought he was going to be a king ruling and reigning. Not some guy, some kid from some podunk town in the middle of nowhere born in a manger. They thought he was going to be a king. Oh, he will be. But before he became the king, he had to become the suffering servant. So look with me in Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you. Notice how he throws in the podunk town. Was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him. Just as yourselves should know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to kill him and nail him to a cross. God raised him up, ending the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by death. For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope. Because you will not abandon me in Hades or in hell or allow your Holy One to see decay. You have revealed the path of life to me. You will find, fill me with gladness in your presence or in your presence is fullness of joy. That is what the cross brings in every single life in here, the fullness of joy. Pay attention, you do not want to miss this today. Brothers and sisters, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David, the King David, the prophet David. The priest David. He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on his throne. And Jesus is that descendant. Seeing what was to come, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not abandoned in Hades, and his flesh did not experience decay. God has raised this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Lord, Lord, I crucified your son, Jesus Christ, with my sin. I rebelled against you and shook my fist at you for many years. Yet because of your great love for me and your mercy and your grace, you reached down and gave me forgiveness. You redeemed me from the power of sin, from the penalty of sin, from the punishment of sin. And set my feet upon the rock, which is Christ Jesus. Pray if there's anybody in here this morning that does not have a relationship with you, Lord. That they're separated from God Most High by their sin this morning. That they would turn to you for forgiveness. Turn to you for grace. And turn to you for mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's break this apart this morning. Here, Peter now switches everything to one theme and one theme only. And that main theme of the text is Jesus is Messiah. The person of Jesus Christ. He is Messiah. The God-man. The God sent his son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That God himself became a man to walk where we walk, to live how we live, to show us that it can be done and that it would be done and that he lived a holy and righteous life and then died on the cross for you and for me in our place. Because rejecting God always means that there is judgment. 
You rebel against God. You think the God of creator of heaven and earth and everything in it is going to allow his human race to reject him and shake their fist at him and deny him and then allow them to live an abundant life? No, he created hell for the devil and his angels, but he allows man to choose to go there. Yet he provided a way in his great love that Jesus would come and die. And the Jews wanted a different kind of Messiah, yet they were going to get this one. And the first thing we note in this sermon is filled with Jesus, and we see it. Time and time again, Peter is going to bring up the Messiah because he knows there's power in that name. There's salvation in that name. And matter of fact, in Acts 1.8, it actually says that when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, they will testify of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let's quickly look at these four reasons. The first reason why you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Messiah, your Christ, your Savior and Lord is his miracles in his life. Look with me in verse 22. What does it say there in verse 22? It says that Jesus did miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among them through him just as you yourself know. Everybody knew it. Everybody saw Jesus walking around healing the blind, the lame, the lepers, casting demon out of people. Matter of fact, many of these people had loved ones that Jesus had touched and healed. Miracles, signs, and wonders went wherever Jesus went, wherever he walked. The people knew it. Matter of fact, Nicodemus himself said, look, no one can do these miracles unless God is with you. So everywhere Jesus went, his life attested to God by miracles, signs, and wonders. Matter of fact, in Acts chapter 1 verse 3, it says, by many infallible proofs, Jesus testified So God confirmed Jesus as Lord in Christ by giving him the power to do miracles. Yet the religious folk attributed these miracles to Satan, interestingly enough. But the reason God does miracles is because he always wants to manifest his power, his might, and his glory. Miracles aren't for genie in the bottle. To get something that we want. Miracles are to attest to something. Remember when God fed the 5,000? Jesus fed the 5,000. What did he say after that? I am the bread of life. He wanted to communicate a very important spiritual fact. Remember when he raised Lazarus from the dead? He wanted to communicate a very important fact. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will not perish but have everlasting life. Miracles are to attest to God's glory, power, and grace. And so when Jesus walked on this earth, proving that God was with him, doing the miracles that only he could do, and showing that he was truly God. So their rejection of the Messiah was not based on a lack of information. They had seen Jesus do all kinds of things, but they rejected him and hated him because here, listen to this very carefully. Because they liked the status quo. They liked how things were. They liked their sin and their picture of this fake Jesus that was supposed to be this king rather than a suffering servant. I would even go as far to say as they loved their religion more than they loved personal relationship with Jesus Christ. How many of you know people like that? How many of you grew up in religious families? Cultish families, Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, people that different Jesus. The ones that tell you that it's about doing, not being. That you have to do this to earn your way into heaven. You have to save 3,000 Hail Marys. You have to take mass to get saved. You have to go door to door and knock. You have to make yourself holy. You can't make yourself holy. Garrett can't make himself holy. The Holy Spirit makes Garrett holy. Christ's blood makes Garrett holy. It is not about religion. It is about relationship. And these people wanted to die in their religion rather than have a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
You cannot earn your way into heaven. It is a free gift given to you by Jesus Christ because of his sacrifice. Amen? Amen. This is my king. This is my Jesus. Bought, paid for by Jesus Christ, Garrett Grobner. When God the Father sees Garrett Grobner, he sees God the Son and the blood poured out on that cross, wrapped in his body. I don't need to do anything else but believe but to have faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. The second thing we see, the second thing we see, well, let, let me, eh, all right. Look at me with John chapter 10, verse 37. <clears throat> Be on the screen. If I do not do the works of my father, do not believe me. But if I do, Though you do believe me, believe, if you don't believe in me, believe the works. That you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I am in him. And by the way, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, the Father is in you and you are in him. And you are in Jesus and the, Jesus is in you and the Holy Spirit is in you. And I can't back up that we're in the Holy Spirit. But we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes alongside of us. John eleven forty six, after the resurrection of Nazareth, then many of the Jews who had come to Mary, they'd seen Lazarus raised from the dead. This is how hard hard they hearted they are and how they wanted to stay in their religion rather than have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Had seen the things Jesus did and believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What should we do? But this man works many signs. And they began to plot his death. Wow. Hey, this dude raised somebody from the dead. Let's kill him. So they killed him. And then God raised this dude from the dead. Woo! <laughs> right? Iro- irony, right? John 15, 24 says, if I had done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and they also hated both me and my father. But this happened, that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without cause. Listen. If you do not want to believe anything else in, the, in Jesus Christ, if you want to look at the miracles and the signs and wonders that he did, take a look at changed lives and transformed life. Take a, take a look at the life of Garrett Grobner who hated. You messed with me, I would stick you or shoot you. I would sell you drugs. I would commit adultery. I would abort a baby. I would shake my fist at God. Miracle sign and wonder. Addicted to drugs. Drank at least a pint of tequila every day. Swords and tequila carried me through the night. Yet in one act of God's grace and mercy, he reached down and he filled me with his Holy Spirit and saved me. And I didn't need 12 steps. I had one step to the cross of Jesus Christ and I've never looked back. And I am an unmedicated, spirit-filled, holy roller follower of Jesus Christ. You can't touch this, King of kings and Lord of glory. I am a miracle, period, the end. And my Savior did it. And he did it to my brother. And he did it to my sister. And he did it to my father and my mother. And he'll do it to you. 
Men, you come to Christ, your whole family will follow. Philippian jailer and his whole household. Jarius and his whole household. Noah and his whole household. Cornelius and his whole household. The rich young ruler and his whole household. Follow Christ. Preach Christ. Live Christ. And watch what happens in your family, men. It's time for men to man up. And start living for Jesus. It's who he is. Number two. The death of Christ. Some people preach Jesus will give you happiness. Jesus comes along and he's just wonderful and gives you this, that, and the other thing. But that's not what the cross of Jesus Christ is about. And I hear I've had women look me in the eye and say, well, God, God Garrett, I'm going to divorce my husband because really Jesus just wants me to be happy. I'm going to divorce my husband. Where's that in the Bible? No, he wants you to repent, suck it up, die to yourself. That's what he wants. Now, don't get me wrong. I know there's biblical reasons for divorce. This isn't going to be a sermon on divorce. So take a deep breath. Relax. The Bible says very clearly that the only thing that the, that the blood of Christ won't cover is divorce. Somebody should yell heretic right now. It's a lie from the pit of hell. The only sin that the blood of Christ will not forgive through the cross of Jesus Christ is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and that's denying Christ to your deathbed. That sin will not be forgiven. Never appropriating the substitutional atonement of Jesus Christ into your own life and being forgiven of your sins. That's the only thing that will send you to hell for all eternity where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Every other sin is forgivable. Doesn't matter what it is. Ooh, isn't that awesome news? <laughs> the death of Christ, verse 23. So he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge. You used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. I just say thank you that he used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. Because without killing him, I would not have salvation. And while Jesus was hanging on that cross, blood flowing from his hands, where his back had been ripped open by a cat of nine tails that had steel and pottery sewn into it, to the point where his flesh and his sinew and his bones were exposed, where it would rip around and grab into the side where his ribs are and pull chunks of his flesh out, crown of thorns, thorns shoved into his, into, his, into his head, beard ripped out of his face, spit on, mocked, slapped in the face. At any moment, could have taken himself down off that cross and destroyed everybody. Thank God I'm not Jesus because everybody that slapped me or punched me or hit me would be piles of ashes. <laughs> and everybody that voted for that baby bill would be piles of ashes. God loves them. All right, somebody better order pizza. I'm only on point two, the death. And here's what the Jewish people were saying. There's no way Jesus could be the Messiah. Why was he nailed to a cross? If Jesus was the Messiah, why didn't he use his power to avoid the cross? Because if he wouldn't have went to the cross, he couldn't have provided substitutionary atonement or your substitute on that cross. He couldn't have taken your place where God poured out the wrath that you deserve upon Jesus on that cross. Where he poured the judgment that you deserve out upon Jesus on that cross. Where he poured the sins of the world out on Jesus on that cross. Where it broke his heart so much that he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22 prophesied a thousand years before Jesus came and died on the cross. Read Psalm 22 if you want to know. Read Isaiah chapter 53, 750 years before the cross. Both those, if you're not a believer, write those down. Isaiah 53 and, and Psalm 22. And if you are a believer, read those. And you can see the prophecy a thousand years and 750 years before Jesus Christ. And they found these Dead Sea Scrolls that prove that those are really truly written before Jesus died on the cross. And as Peter was trying to get everybody to believe in the Messiah, he wants you to believe in the Messiah today. 
That Jesus is who he says he is. And so his death on the cross didn't catch God by surprise. It says right there in verse 23, the predetermined and foreknowledge. Before Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, he was already figuring out a way how to save his creation. The apple of his eye, the, the one whose his thoughts are uh, as the sands of the seashore, you and me. The one who he says, I'll never leave them or forsake them. The one that he adopted and forgave and elected and predestined and saved before the foundation of the world. And bought you with a price and, and adopted you into his family. And sealed you with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is a guarantee of your salvation. And gave you mercy and forgiveness and the love. And conveyed you into the kingdom of the son of his love. Now you are joint heirs with Christ because of that cross. And now when you sin and I sin. And Satan comes up before the throne of God and says, did you see what Garrett did? Jesus stands there always making intercession for us. Always being the mediator. You don't need a priest or anybody else to mediate for you. You have the King of Kings and the Lord of Glory mediating for you. Jesus Christ. And he stands there and he says, Garrett did it again. Satan says, Garrett did it again. And what does, Satan, what does Jesus say? Put that to my account. I died for that. I died for your sins, past, present, and future. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When Jesus Christ stands before God the Father and says, put that to the count. It justifies me just as I never did it. Is that good news? Can we say thank you, King Jesus? And God in his holiness could not look upon Jesus on the cross when our sins were dumped upon him. So he turns his back on God the Son who they had ever eternal fellowship with they had never been broken their communion had never been broken but on the cross god broke communion with jesus christ so that you do not have to suffer for all eternity communion broken with jesus christ and god the father my god my god why have you forsaken me and it was so drastic that his heart broke that when they poked him in the side, after he said, it is finished, what does he mean it's finished? I died for every sin of every mankind. For whoever will apply the blood of Jesus Christ to my life can have everlasting life and have it abundantly. And they stabbed him in the side and water and blood came out. You know what that's a sign of? A broken heart. What's it called? What's it? Hypo. Come on, docs. Where's, there's another. Where, I saw Terry over here. We got three doctors in here. Help me out, guys. What's it called? What, hypo, what is it? Okay. If you think about it, yell it out later. I, I, I usually know what it is, but I'm drawing a blank right now. Jesus died of a broken heart. Cross of Jesus Christ. I have a determined among you to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. God was sitting up in heaven when Jesus died on the cross. He was like, I just don't know what happened. This day just got out of, out of control. I just, it just got away from me. No. Verse 23. Determined plan and foreknowledge. It was all my plan. He knew all along he was going to send his son to die on that cross for you and for me and provide salvation. Matter of fact, 1 John 2, 2 says this, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. That's a big word, but here's what it means. Satisfying payment. Simple. And not for ours, but for the whole world. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold. You weren't bought with anything this world has to offer. From your aimless conduct, Garrett's aimless conduct, his sin, his debauchery, his power-hungry, greedy, violent person that he was. Received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. 
As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He was holy. He had never sinned. That's why he can die in your place. He never had an evil thought, an evil action, an evil deed, or an evil word. He was holy and blameless. All right, I'm going to go on another rabbit trail. Why? Let me break it down for you. When Adam and Eve sinned, their blood got tainted and sin entered their blood, their DNA. And that DNA has been passed down to every single person in this room. There is no one good, no, not one. Every single person has in this room has sinned. How many of you have never told a lie? Raise your hand. Good, I'm glad there's no liars in here this morning. <laughs> How many of you have ever not thought a lustful or a dirty thought? Raise your, mind, raise your hand. Okay, a little eight-year-old, that's good. Praise God. <laughs> How many of you have thought, never thought about slapping or killing somebody? How many of you little kids ever had to be taught the word no? No! We've all sinned and fallen short of the grace of God. Right? We're all, all my kids, all eight of them are a bunch of little sinners. And since the day they're born, they worship the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. Right? But Jesus was different. Jesus didn't have Adam's blood running through his body. Let track with me here. Every single one of you are sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. You're in Adam. Jesus is the second Adam, the Adam that never sinned, that didn't fall in the garden, that didn't eat the apple, that didn't transgress. His father was of the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, when the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, Gabriel shows up, talks to Mary and says, she's like, how am I going to be pregnant? I've never known a man. I've never had sex. And what does God, what does Gabriel say? Relax, chill out. The Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you and the baby is going to be of the Holy Spirit. So what happened? And track with me here. You have the egg. You have the sperm. I was going to have a man can get pregnant joke, but I'm going to resist. <laughs> Pull out, Garrett. <laughs> okay, I'm back. The blood is in the sperm. The blood is not in the egg. The blood is in the sperm, the sperm of Adam, every single man in here. That sin nature in the DNA enters that egg, and all of a sudden, that egg now begins to become, it becomes a baby, by the way, as soon as that happens. It doesn't happen a month later, a week later, a day later, an hour later. It happens in a nanosecond. And that beautiful child made in the likeness and image of God begins to form. And what happens is, is that egg now attaches itself to the inside and from that very second that it attaches it begins to make its own blood and its own food gotten from the mother it no longer are you guys tracking with me so now the Holy Spirit who is God impregnates Mary supernaturally Adam's blood is no longer passed on to Jesus Christ, the second Adam. Therefore, his blood was not tainted by sin. That is why he is the God-man, fully God, fully man. You cannot make this stuff up when the Bible was written before science even knew this. You did not come from a monkey. Your eyeball, which is one of the most miraculous miracles in the world, that brings in light and bounces off the back of your brain and, and, and produces images in your ear, that brings in sound waves in your mind that controls your body and your DNA, cannot happen by accident. Yet the schools Darwin teaches in every day tells you that you became, you came from a monkey. And we're shocked when they act like monkeys. Now, why did I share all this? Because life is in the blood. And the holy, righteous King Jesus was sacrificed on that cross. He never knew sin. And all of a sudden, sin was permeating him by, the, by, the, by my sin and your sin being poured out upon our King and our Savior, Jesus Christ, on that cross. And it broke his heart. 
Because he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. And believing in him by faith, we become righteous. So when God sees us, he does not see his son, our sin. He sees his son. Amen. Number three. And I'll try to wrap this up. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter in verse 24. God raised him ending the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by that. And then he goes on in the next nine verses to explain the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the climax of the, resurrect, of, the, of the redemption story. Without the resurrection from the dead, we would have no hope. Without the resurrection, resurrection of the dead, we should be pitied and laughed at and mocked. The resurrection is everything. And he, he begins to explain in those verses, you can go back and read over them yourself, that look, David was talking right here about Jesus Christ never seeing corruption, never experiencing the death the way we experience death. David, the tomb was right over there. David's bones still sit in that tomb, but Jesus' tomb is empty. And without the resurrection, yes, we're a bloody religion but we're also a, a resurrection religion without the resurrection of jesus christ we would have no hope we might as well pack it up and go home we shouldn't even have church today let me read what paul says in first corinthians chapter 15 but if there is no resurrection of the dead then christ is not risen and if christ is not risen then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty Yes, and we, found, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up. If in fact the dead do not rise, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. Your faith is a joke. Your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have died or fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all of men the most pitiable. We're a joke. We might as well. Without the resurrection, I would be a Viking. Why not? If I came from a monkey in my brain, why not rob, kill, and destroy like Satan does? For the resurrection of the dead is everything, my friends. It's what we, it's the greatest proof Jesus is the Messiah. Not his teaching, his miracles, or even his death, but the resurrection from the dead. And we no longer need to fear. Matter of fact, look in verse 24. It said, Jesus loosed the pains of death. He conquers death. We no longer have funerals. I don't even like to call them celebrations of life. If you're a blood-bought saint of God, we have worship services when we die. Celebrate. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. It happens that fast. And we're face to face with Jesus Christ. And now Peter breaks down Psalm 16 and those next verses. He's saying, look, we need to rejoice and be glad because Jesus hoped in God and we should hope in God. David's not resurrected, but Jesus will. Je David will be resurrected someday. But what I really want to turn our attention to is verse 28, because many of you miss joy. You miss peace. Because of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, because of the death of Jesus Christ, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we now have the presence of God in our life. And in his presence is what? Fullness of joy. You can experience the abundant life. You can experience Christ to its fullest. The only thing that's keeping you from experiencing the, everything that God has for you, everything that Jesus Christ has for you, and experience his presence and his abundant life and his mercy, his grace, and his power in his life is you. Lay down you. Lay down your wants, your wills, your desires. 
Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow him. Abide in him and he will abide in you and you will bear much fruit. And in that, you will experience his presence like you've never dreamed or imagined. You will experience the abundant life like you've never dreamed or imagined. You will know what it's like to live in his presence. And knowing what it's like to live in his presence because in his presence is fullness of joy. When I step out of that, I feel it. And when I sin, I feel that separation, that communion broken. And I run back to him in repentance because I use the Christian bar of soap every day. You confess with your mouth. Your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The only one that can bring guilt, condemnation, and shame back into your life is Satan and you. There's therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Finally, my last point. Looks like I'm going to make it in 40 minutes. Wow. Okay. Praise the Lord. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. Number four, the, the complete gospel, the ascension and exaltation of Jesus Christ. Look with me in verse 33 and 34. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, Jesus, he has poured out what you both see in here today. Because he has been exalted, God, now they regain their communion that they had from eternity past. Now he can pour out his Holy Spirit upon his church and upon his people. The promise of the Holy Spirit. For it was not David who ascended into the heavens. Because these are Jews, remember. Guys, I know you're expecting David, but this is Jesus. But it's he himself, the Lord declared to my Lord, God, 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 Jesus, God, the Father, and God, the Holy Spirit. The Lord declared, this is Jesus declared to the Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. We can say it another way. God declared to Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Listen, those of you that don't know Jesus Christ, I want you to really focus hard on this next verse I'm about to read in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. And I also want you to think of this, Christian, that God the Son humbled himself and became a man. And he humbled himself. And what happened? Because God, Jesus humbled himself and died on the cross and became a man. Humility is the way to exaltation. You humble yourself, God will exalt you. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that every knee shall bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. This is his exalted position. This is who he is. This is Jesus Christ in him crucified, my friends. If you do not know Jesus Christ and you die today on your way home, you will bow before Jesus Christ and you will believe that he is Messiah. But if today, the day of salvation, you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and Messiah, you will be saved from your sins and from everlasting torment separated from God Almighty for all eternity. Guys, in verse 36, excuse me, verse 37, what they, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized each one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for those who are far off. Garrett was a far off and now that promise came to Garrett and now that promise looks like it's coming bare on Garrett's children. As many as the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he testified and strongly urged them be saved from this corrupt generation and 3,000 that day were saved and they were baptized. They realized that they were responsible Every single one of you in this room is responsible and nailed Jesus to the cross with your sin. Not one of you did not. 
They were cut to the heart when they saw the light, when they heard him preach about the life and the miracles of Jesus Christ, the death of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the ascension and the exaltation of Jesus Christ. They were cut to the heart and they said, what shall we do? Is there any hope for us? We see now that Jesus did what he said he was going to do and he is who he says he is. And they were cut to the heart and they repented and they were baptized. And they began to experience the abundant life by being filled and empowered and blessed by the Holy Spirit, which is Christ in them, the hope of glory. The same power that raised Christ from the dead, the resurrected power of Jesus Christ, living and surging through their lives and their bodies. On the screen, without Jesus, without Jesus, there's no eternal life. Without Jesus, there's no supernatural abundant life. Without Jesus, there's no changed life. Without Jesus, there's no church to pour out his spirit upon. Without Jesus, if it wasn't for the life, the death, the resurrection and exaltation of Jesus, our life would be hopeless. The greatest and most important decision that you can make today is to believe Jesus Christ not just for his miracles not just for his cross not just because of his resurrection not just because of his exaltation and glorification because of these words right here Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life and nobody gets to the father nobody can have eternal life but by me and you have to determine whether Jesus is a liar a lunatic or telling the truth I can't make that decision for you and just like these men here in Jerusalem and these women here in Jerusalem, the most important decision they had to determine whether Jesus Christ was the Messiah that God promised to send in the person of Jesus Christ. And we have to do the same. Stand with me. And let's pray. Father, thank you for these people, perseverance and patience this morning. I pray they have a knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ to go out and share with people far and wide. I pray for protection on all the churches in America and all the Christian life-saving life centers that preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. Pray that we could make coherent, logical statements to convince people to save their babies. Heck, I'll take 30 of them right now, Lord. I pray that Tuesday would be a second chance for the state of Colorado for righteousness. That people that call evil good and good evil would be replaced God please I plead with you to give us a second chance Lord you gave us Roe versus Wade you overturned it today Lord yesterday on Friday from what I heard that's 1500 babies a day saved from the wrath of the devil Please, Lord, we're pleading with you for mercy, Lord. We don't deserve it. 70 million babies crying, blood crying out from the ground. The church complacent and complicit is they spread their sexual deviant doctrine and people say nothing, do nothing. God, forgive us. 
May we stand for righteousness, even if it costs us our life. May we stand for truth, even if it costs us our life. May we stand for justice, even if it costs us our life. Lord, I don't know how in the last 50 years Christians have become so cowardice. The church was bold in the 16th century, willing to die and get burned at the cross for the cross of Jesus Christ and the word of God. In the 17th and 18th and early 19th century, people were willing to stand and die for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we worry about what we're going to lose. We're apathetic and materialistic and selfish. And God, forgive us. Please give us a second chance. Lord, I confess as Daniel confessed the sins of his nation. I confess the sins of our nation, Lord. Those babies' blood screaming out from the ground like the blood of righteous Abel. I confess when I get cowardly about sharing your gospel. Please help us, Lord. Help us to be men and women after your own heart. That we would not fear man, but you and you alone. 